gather in his name, the scripture says, amen. amen. So we're so glad that you're here, and we pray for those who are not with us today, and the blessing that they will surely miss out on. God has a blessing here for each of us, and we'll be receptive to it and receive it. And uh, maybe we'll sing a few more in with our hymn this morning. Let's, let's see if we can do that. Let's turn to number 635, and we'll begin our service with our hymn of praise. Faith of our fathers. It is Father's Day, and we wish a happy Father's Day to each of our dads who are present with us today. Uh, the, the Christian father means so much to the family, uh, families of the world today. If you are the backbone, you are the moms, whom we celebrated last month. And so we appreciate all that you do. So right now, let's stand and sing a song about fathers. 635, Faith of Our Fathers.
And we ask all of this through Christ Jesus our Lord, the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 through 18. And there we read these words. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Well, Elijah was afraid, and he ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the desert. And he came to a broom tree, and sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. And then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. And he looked around, and there by his head was a cake of bread baked by hot coals and a jar of water. And he ate and drank, and then he lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and he ate and he drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights till he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. Then he went into a cave and spent the night, and the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. And the Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. And then a great and powerful wind tore through the mountains, tore them apart, shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. And then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. And I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. And the Lord said to him, Go back the way you came, and go to the desert of Damascus. And when you get there, anoint Hazael, king over Aram, also anoint Jehu, the son of Neshimi, king over Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel, Meloah, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Hazael, and Elisha will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and all whose mouths have not kissed him. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Our next hymn together is our hymn of prayer. As we remember all of those we just mentioned, and all those thoughts are on our heart and minds that need to be made in prayer as well. Let's sing the chorus, Thou Art Worthy, number 114. This is a short one, so we're going to sing it through twice. When you get to the end, just go back and we'll sing from the beginning again. Thou Art Worthy, page 114. <laughs>
Father God, we come to you this morning with grateful hearts again to be in your, your house this morning, Lord. Amen. We come here to celebrate Father's Day, Lord. We thank you so much for that Father up in heaven. We thank you for our earthly Father, dear Lord. Those that have come, those that are still here, Lord, we thank you so much for them. Lord, we pray for those that are sick this morning. we got a lot of empty pews today. Whether they're sick, if they're traveling, Lord, we ask you to be with them, guide them, direct them, and bring them back to us next week. We ask you, Lord, that this thing, last Sunday was so much different than this Sunday that happened. Uh, that all the killings and stuff that were going on, Lord, I don't know, I don't know what to ask for. But I ask for peace, Lord, to guide me with these people that lost loved ones. Those that lost loved ones here in Austin today. As the guys who brought us through this week, in Christ's name we pray to you.
toward the cross of Calvary for our salvation. Christ's name we pray.
always with you. Amen. Let's stand and fellowship for just a moment. On the water comes down. For Jesus had commanded the evil spirit to come out of the man. 
Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him. And they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into them, and then he gave them permission. And when the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs. And the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and countryside. When the people went out to see what happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. And then all the people of the region of Gerasthenes had asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. So he got in the boat and he left. And the man from whom the demons had, run, had gone out begged to go with him, but Jesus sent him away saying, Return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Loving God, breathe your spirit upon us that we might receive your word afresh and anew. Take my lips and speak through them. Take our minds and think through them. And take our hearts and set them on fire. And we ask this in the name of Jesus and all God's children said, Amen. I'd like to start with a little poem today, and it's called Fathers Are Wonderful People, and it goes like this. Fathers are wonderful people, too little understood, and we do not sing their praises as often as we should. For somehow Father seems to be the man who pays the bills, while Mother binds up little hurts and nurses all our ills. And Father struggles daily to live up to his image as a protector and provider and the hero of the scrimmage. And perhaps that's the reason we sometimes get the notion that fathers are not subject to this thing we call emotion. But if you look inside Dad's heart where no one else can see, you'll find he's sentimental and as soft as he can be. But he's so busy every day in the grueling race of life that he leaves the sentimental stuff to his partner and his wife. But fathers are just wonderful in a million different ways, and they merit loving compliments and accolades of praise. For the only reason Dad aspires to fortune and success is to make his family proud of him and bring him happiness. And like our Heavenly Father, he's a guardian and a guide, someone that we can count on to be always on our side. And that poem is about a model family with a mother and father and children all living together. And would to God that this would always be the case but what struck me about the poem, aside from its lovely attempt to praise fathers, as they ought to be praised, were the lines in the middle. Those were the lines that go, we sometimes get the notion that fathers are not subject to this thing we call emotion. But if you look inside Dad's heart where no one else can see, you'll find he's sentimental and as soft as he can be. Now I think there are many fathers, even young fathers, and they work hard and long and did the best they could for their families, and their pains and their sorrows were for the most part hidden. And we may even know people like this, and maybe even their hopes and their dreams were hidden because they had to put those on the back burner. For many and most generations, it was easy to get the impression that fathers had or have no emotions. And they indeed left all the sentimental stuff, as the poem said, to their wives. But it isn't always so. Underneath everything, men, just as much as women, fathers as much as mothers, feel and they feel deeply. And it's just that so many of them get caught up in the performance of their duties, in fulfilling roles that they're expected to fulfill, or think that they're expected to fulfill, that they suppress their emotions. They're busy every day. They're trying to make a home and a life for their families. They have expectations of themselves and their children. And the achievement and measurement of these things sometimes becomes more important than them taking care of themselves. I always tell new hires at work when I do the, the tours and, and the, the orientation that you, the first thing you've got to do 
is to take care of yourself. And you know that applies to everybody, not just dads, not just law enforcement officers. It applies to people, amen? You've got to take care of yourself because you're no good to anyone else if you're sick either physically or emotionally or mentally. You've got to take care of yourself and make sure you do that on a daily basis. Because when some people don't do that, the result is that you grow tired, you grow depressed, and some of these fathers we're talking about while their children will even become alienated from them. Because children don't know how to deal with a parent that's like that. And some burn out. And some would simply acquire, acquire a, a reputation of being demanding or unappreciative of their families or their children. But underneath all of that, underneath all of that, there is flesh and blood that grows tired and screams out for rest, demands spiritually to be fed, but believes that they must feed others first. Flesh and blood that needs guidance, but they also feel that they have to guide everybody else first. What's the old saying? You know, the doctor's kids are always sick, and the shoemaker's kids never have decent shoes because they're always taking care of everybody else and doing for everybody else. Amen. It's hard to be a father. And uh, when I say all this, I'm, on the other hand, silently, I'm saying it's hard to be a mother too. Okay, but mom, y'all had your month last month, okay? So we're dealing with that today. But it's hard to be a father. It's hard. I've never been one, but I've watched many fathers grow up, and I've even had fathers through the church here and those at work come to me for advice I, simply because I guess I'm a minister and they think I know everything. Well, I got them fooled, don't I? But they'll come to me for advice. How do I deal with this? i got this problem going on at home with my family, with my wife, with my children. And a lot of men, it's hard to admit that because fathers think that they have to be strong and that everybody expects them to be strong. And in today's reading, if you remember back from the book of 1 Kings that we read earlier in the service, we're introduced to a man who was at the end of his rope. We've never been there, have we? What's the old saying? When you come to the end of your rope, tie not hang on. <laughs> well, Elijah had just about run out of rope. Elijah was worn out. He couldn't go any farther. He was exhausted. He had fought the good fight, was at the end of his rope. He had battled against the false prophet, prophets of the court of Ahab, the king. He had spoken against the idolatry fostered by Queen Jezebel. He had performed his duties. He had lived up to his calling as best he could. And then as a result, he was condemned to die by those who were angry at him and those that God had sent him to preach against. And so what did he do? He had to flee. He fled into the wilderness. He was alone. He was afraid. He was feeling sorry for himself. And he lay down under a miserable old broom tree. A bush barely able to give shade to a bird. They call it a tree, but if you've ever seen a picture of a broom tree, uh, it barely able to shade a bird, much less or an animal, much less a man. And he was wishing that he was dead, telling God he had had enough, and he fell asleep. And what happened? Well, an angel woke him up by a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And the scripture says Elijah ate that and drank that water, and he lay down. Again. Sounds like me. The Bible did. Notice what the angel who ministers to him does not do. Very important here. I don't know if you ever picked it up as many times as you probably read the scripture. Notice what the angel does not do. The angel does not do what we would call spiritual stuff. The angel doesn't say to Elijah, pray about it, Elijah, and you'll feel better. The angel doesn't say, I'll pray for you. The angel doesn't do all those spiritual things. Now, they're important, amen, but there's a time for everything. And I've always told people, that's why places like the rescue mission and all those places are so important because if somebody needs Jesus Christ in their life, me walking up to a homeless person or someone who's hungry and taking this Bible and putting it in their face, let me show you here how you can be a child of God, and they're starving to death, or they don't have decent clothes to wear, are they going to listen to me? No. Absolutely not. That angel knew, and that angel was sent by God, so that means God knows 
We need to be providing and taking care of ourselves physically, emotionally, and then the spiritual as well. They're all three important. The angel didn't do any of those spiritual things. The angel fed him and let him rest. Didn't tell him to get up and keep going, you know, how we like to tell people, get up, you know, keep, you know, keep on keeping on. What are you laying there sleeping for? You've got work to do. The angel feeds him, makes him rest, and tells him that if he doesn't do those things, he said the journey's going to be too much for him. Sometimes we just need a timeout, amen. Right. I miss the timeouts mommy used to put me in. Back then I didn't appreciate it. Now I would love for my boss to come in at work and say, Time out. Take a nap. Put your head down on your desk. <laughs> Just don't get them anymore, do we? I can use the time out a couple times, could we? Wednesday night, Tuesday night, Monday night. <laughs> Sometimes we just need that time out. Because we really need to pause and we need to eat. We need to eat we need to eat physically and also need to eat spiritually. For sure. But we, we need to drink. We need to sustain ourselves so that we can continue the journey that God has got us on so that we can get up and move forward. Only then are we ready for prayer. Only then when we're physically fed and taken care of can we be ready to be spiritually restored. Amen? Amen. And that story continues on with Elijah continuing into the wilderness and then he comes to Mount Horeb, to the mountain of God, to the place where God revealed himself to Moses, you'll remember, and to Israel in a cloud and in fire. And there the Lord speaks to him and tells him he's about to pass by. He says he's about to show himself to him. And Elijah goes out to the mouth of that cave and he spent the night and he looks for the Lord in that strong wind that came up the mountain. Reminds me of the wind of Pentecost almost. Surely God is in that. He was in the wind at Pentecost, wasn't he? So surely he's in that wind. And then in the earthquake, well gosh, how many times in the scriptures did God make the earth move? Surely he was in that. And then fire. Fire was at Pentecost too. The cloven tongues of flame rested on their head. Surely God was in that fire. He doesn't find God in any of those things. Any of those powerful, majestic things that we would assume God would be in, God wasn't in any of those. But after all of that, what comes along? A whisper. A whisper. That's what we call today a still small voice. We tell people, listen to that still small voice. And that is what God is in and visits with Elijah. Picture the story. We have wind, earthquake, fire. All of these things are busy, busy things. They're things that make you look. They're things that make you be cautious. And they're loud. But God wasn't in any of those. So I ask you today as we close, have you ever felt like Elijah? Have you ever felt like God's not listening to you? That nobody is really following God? That you're the only one left and you can't find God? That you might as well just give up and die? Maybe it's all the busyness. Maybe it's all the commotion in your life, the hurry to the next activity, the trying to cope, the work that you do to try to make a good life for even just yourself, if you're a single or for your family. All of that gets in the way of your living and gets in the way of you seeing what you need to see and hearing what you need to hear. And sometimes we need to just stop and listen, and that's what Elijah was led to do. And Elijah, in his exhaustion and fear, he timed out. He got away for a little while. And then God came in that sheer silence and he equipped Elijah to move forward. And he assured Elijah that he wasn't alone and that many faithful persons were still with him. And sometimes that's what we need as men, as fathers, as women, as mothers, as God's children. We have to take time out and get in touch with God. We have to pause and listen so that we can have the strength and guidance to do what we're needed to do. Think about the number of times that Jesus took time apart and how he would send the disciples ahead of him while he paused to pray on a mountainside. How he would prepare himself for his next activity by first going away himself to pray, to listen to the silence. We all need restoration. It can be found in silence and being apart and being with God. And they allow us to refocus and to refresh ourselves and to remember what's important and remember what's not. 
There was a story in the Christian Reader I'm going to close with. It's been a few years ago now, but it was called The Priceless Scribbles. And it contained a father who had touched his life, child's life in a very unexpected way. And it started like this. It said, as my father walked into the living room, my brother cowered slightly, and he sensed he had done something wrong. And from a distance I could see he had opened my brother, father's brand new hymnal and scribbled all over the first page with an ink pen. And staring at my father fearfully, we both waited for his punishment. My father picked up his prized hymnal, and he looked at it carefully, and then he sat down without saying a word. The writer says books were precious to him because he was a minister and had several degrees. And for him, books were knowledge. And what he did next was remarkable. Instead of punishing my brother, instead of scolding or yelling at him, he took the pen out of my brother's hand, opened the book to that first page, and then wrote in the book himself. And alongside those scribbles that my brother John had made, he wrote, John's work, 1959, age 2. How many times... The writer says, have I looked into your beautiful face, talking about his father, into your warm, alert eyes, looking up at me, and thanked God for the one who had scribbled in the hymnal and your compassion. The father said, you made the book sacred, as have you and your brother and sister to my life. And I thought, wow, is this punishment? So the author went on to say how the hymnal became a treasured family possession and it was proof that their parents loved them and taught them the lesson that what really matters is people, not objects. Patience, not judgment. Love, not anger. These things that come to us as humans, we pause, they come to us when we pause to listen to God. And the poem that began this sermon suggested that we don't sing the praises of our fathers as often as we should, and that's true. We don't appreciate the humanity our fathers have. How they struggle to do their best. How they sacrifice. How they labor and dream and work for us. And I call you all today to remember to take some time to pause and listen to the silence and then go on and to do what God is calling you to do. And renew yourselves in that strength. I call for you today also to pray for fathers everywhere. Fathers and families. Single fathers. And to pray that they might do pause and eat and drink and listen to the silence. If we had more people do that in the world, could you imagine the strong Christians we'd have out there building this world for Christ? To do and to will what is good and right to do. Let us pray. Lord, indeed, we do pray for our fathers and for those who have fathered us over the years, who've been like fathers for us. Some never had their own children, but they certainly mentored and directed and guided many, many of us. We pray for them and we thank you for them and we ask you now that you might touch them and bless them and to continue to do so and help all the men we know to be ones who listen for your voice and receive your strength and wisdom in their hearing. We pause to remember also our fathers who have gone on to be with you and know that they're waiting for us there on the shores in glory. Thank you for their legacy. Father, for all of us here today, we're here to listen to your voice. We're here to both touch and be touched by you. Listen to the prayers of our hearts at this time, the prayers that we're making in this silence right now, and to listen for your voice in that silence. To hear you say, don't be afraid. You're not alone. I care for you. Father God, we thank you for being with us and assuring us of your love. We ask you, Lord, to speak to others that we have held up before you now in our service earlier by name. For those who are sick, those who are not with us, you are working or traveling, that they might know you're with them and that you care for them and that they don't have to be afraid either. And Lord, we ask that you speak once again to our hearts as we prepare to make decisions and then to leave this place of worship, this place of encounter. Thank you, Father. Thank you in the name of your Son, Christ Jesus. Amen. Our hymn of decision, if you have anything at all to share with us, please come forward as we sing number 628, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. 628. <laughs>
Boys, he will equip us to take care of whatever it is. And uh, one thing I would remind you of, don't forget, next Sunday night, uh, keep your calendar open if you don't have anything going on. Love to have you at the Midway Community Hymn Sing. That's over at Midland Baptist. Uh, next Sunday, June 26, 6 o'clock. So choirs will sing at 6, and then following the service, we'll have some refreshments in the fellowship hall. So do invite a friend, have them come, and enjoy the good singing. It'll be a great time. Let's respond now with our commissioning statement and our benediction. We'll give our core blessing as well. And again, happy Father's Day to all of our dads. In the power of the risen Lord, we now go forth into the world to fulfill our calling as the people of God, the body of Christ. Go in peace, know that God is with you and that you are not alone, and may the power and love and the truth and compassion of our risen Lord uphold, sustain, and direct and keep you both now and always.